e se calhar começávamos. Ok. So I will switch to English. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is uh, Nuno Araújo and I'm the scientific coordinator of the CFTC, that is the Center for Theoretical and Computational Physics from the Faculty of Science uh, of the University of Lisbon. And I would like to welcome you all to this uh, first of a series of webinars. So until the end of the month, for the next two to three weeks, we will have 10 webinars about many different uh, topics to provide you a new overview of the research work that is being developed at our research unit. So from dark matter to fluid mechanics, you will have the opportunity to learn about the state of the art research in particle physics, nonlinear optics, and condensed matter physics. And to close on the 31st of July, we will have a round table with the alumni to discuss how relevant was the training with us for their professional life and industry. So for the first webinar, we invited the, the founder of CFTC, Professor Margarida Tel da Gama. Margarida is a professor of physics at the Faculty of Science from the University of Lisbon, and we will, could say many different things about Margarida and her CV. However, to make it short, I would just highlight that Margarida has more than 40 years of experience in research in theoretical physics, and that over the, the, these for uh, decades, she built a school of theoretical physics in Portugal, which contributed to the development of soft condensed matter physics at international level. In her journey, she had the opportunity to interact with many scientists that were key in the field, learning a lot about what is to be a physicist, and I believe that she will tell us some of those stories today. So, Margarida, without further ado, thank you for your time, and the floor is yours. Well, the mic is yours. The sofa is mine. <laughs> Thank you very much. So you already uh, said that I'm old, but uh, yes, I am old. I'm, I'm quite happy to be old and I'm very proud of all my wrinkles. So uh, now we don't have the video, but this is something that the, the screen does not lie. Something very different from a personal and uh, a, a normal uh, class. Uh, Nuno asked me to give this uh, talk and I, I'm quite happy to share with you some of my ideas on what it is like to be a theoretical physicist and uh, what I think uh, are some messages that I would like to convey. Of course, this is also a personal story and I'm not going to get into many details, but I have to make a reference to those people who helped me uh, become what I am. And, and so for that reason, on this first slide, you don't see any logos because I've been in several places and you'll see those logos and a little bit more when I get to it. So I'm presently, as Nuno said, a professor of physics at the University of Lisbon. And even though the university has merged, it was already called Universidade de Lisboa when, when I arrived. Okay, so, whoops. So um, I'll make a few statements. I'm, I'm pretty sure many of you have uh, seen them, but I want to make a point, and you'll see what the point is, perhaps, at the end of two or three of these slides. But theoretical physics um, covers many, many different areas, but it's certainly a branch of physics that is heavily based. It employs mathematical models, abstractions of physical reality, and this is important, and of systems, and then uh, tries to explain, describe, and predict those natural phenomena. And I want to contrast that with some, something which is uh, uh, even more important, I think, which is uh, experimental physics. Experimental physics uses experimental tools to probe the same phenomena, physical phenomena. So uh, unphysical phenomena are not within the realm of physics, but physicists think that every physical aspect of natural phenomena or man-made uh, phenomena can be described by physics. And in theory, we try to make the models and employ mathematical uh, tools and abstractions to try and describe those systems. And that first slide is inspired on something which is uh, uh, in the lectures of physics by Feynman. And uh, I'll read it to you because I always, uh, uh, always impressed me. He was a theoretical physicist, I'm sure all of you know. But he says there are theoretical physicists to imagine, deduce, and guess at new laws, but do not experiment. And then there are experimental physicists, and now notice, they experiment, and then they do everything else. They imagine, they deduce, and they guess. So uh, 
being himself a theoretical physicist, one wonders, you know, uh, are we some sort of a second rate physicist or what? Are experimental physicists as good as we are uh, or not? And I'll, I'll go through some examples and I'll try to make uh, some comments of my personal feelings about these uh, uh, and my experience about these statements. Okay. I said theoretical physics is very much tied to mathematical models and in fact it's based on mathematical models because we have to be predictive, we have to be quantitative and without this mathematical representation of the physical reality we cannot do that. But Einstein no less was a mathematical physicist or a theoretical physicist says physics is essentially intuitive and concrete. Mathematics is only a means of expressing the laws that govern these phenomena. There's a similar quote in the lectures by Feynman, but I thought, uh, even though Feynman is one of my great favorites, Einstein had some impact on my uh, career very early on when I was thinking of becoming a physicist. So I, I tried to sort of uh, mix these um, quotes and also refer to people that, even if I didn't meet them personally, I mean, Einstein was dead when I started and Feynman was still in the United States and I saw him, I met him, but he was already very much involved in the uh, shuttle uh, disaster and not so much in physics. Okay, so I'd like to say something now, which is more or less the uh, thread of the rest of my talk. And this is the most important tool of a theoretical physicist is his mind, but it's not just his mind, it's training as well, training this mind, training, tapping the power that you can get from your mind. So I think these are really the most important things that any uh, candidate to become a theoretical physicist should uh, take into account. I mean, should take into account that you, know, you cannot do it. You know, it's probably not for everyone. So uh, in, in some sense, we are uh, fortunate that we actually have a mind that we can use for that purpose. But that's not enough, you need to train it. And so it's not either or, it's both. And it's with those two things, you can actually um, do a lot and make a lot of progress in, in a science or branch of physics, which is theoretical physics. Um, this is the quote of Einstein. I don't know if it's true, but he says, the most important tool of theoretical physics is, is waste basket. Well, uh, I'm not sure. I don't think I need a waste basket. If I get it wrong, I get it wrong. Now with computers, we don't even need waste baskets. But I think what he meant um, by this is something that maybe some of us should consider when we're embarking on something which is a, a very uh, expensive uh, experiment and we have to invest a lot of money to build the laboratory and so on. Uh, there are a lot of previous tests. While in theoretical physics, it's really the ideas and how you work these ideas and you don't need so much of uh, well, money and even uh, investment in terms of manpower in building the lab or the tools that will allow you to measure that particular uh, phenomenon. And so this is important because uh, this is really, I think, what distinguishes uh, today theoretical from experimental physicists. And so we are fortunate in the sense that we are more free. We can actually, also we don't have excuses. I mean, we don't have so much excuses as an experimental physicist because they depend much more on um, other tools. And now a little bit about teaching. Of course, in the last 40 years, uh, half of my time was devoted to teaching and what the heck, you know, uh, why, why, why is teaching important? And I always like to remember this quote of Feynman. Again, it's a, a very famous one. He said, and he was very, very imaginative, one of the most creative minds that I've, uh, I've read many biographies and, and he was certainly top. And, but he said, but I don't have good ideas every day. So by teaching, um, I mean, the quote that is here, it's a little bit uh, demeaning because he says, oh, at least when I'm not having a good idea, I'm doing something useful like teaching. But he says something else in the lectures. Uh, in the lectures, he says, by teaching, by having contact with the young students, that makes me think. So if I don't have the ideas, that's actually some way of getting um, a source of new ideas. A good question by a student, even in a first year class, can be a very good way of giving a great mind like Feynman's uh, a way to start thinking about something else. And he was a master of that. So the quote is not really what he meant. And if you read the book, I mean, there are many more quotes um, or 
sentences uh, about that. But if I want to tell you a little bit about theoretical physics, I think I have to start from the beginning. Of course, a theoretical physicist is a man or a woman or whatever, but uh, robots are not considered theoretical physicists because we need this creativity and we need these new ideas that are now beyond any robot or any artificial intelligence that is conceivable at the moment. And in my view, it's not likely to, uh, to be achieved anyway. <clears throat> so it really is something which um, I think is done by people. But the way we do it now, um, if you look at Wikipedia, they'll tell you that physics started 2000 years ago with Archimedes. Well, that's not quite true. I mean, the scientific method in physics was pioneering that or actually contributing to that really started with these people. I mean, Galileo and, and Newton. And I want to make a remark. You all heard about Galileo and about Newton. Galileo was able to make some observations for the first time because he himself built the instruments, the telescopes that allow him, allowed him to do that. Newton was more of a theoretical physicist, although he did many experiments. Many of them were not very good experiments. So he's remembered as a theoretical physicist. But he did something that theoretical physicists do. He used all the data that had been collected by other people before him and he tried to construct and he did succeed in constructing a theory that synthesized all the observations but he did something else uh, in, in order to be able to do that he had to use and make a similar synthesis or even uh, invent some mathematics that were needed to do that so for me, Newton, even though he did some experiments, some of them even in alchemy, and, and I mean, they're better forgotten. I mean, I, I read many biographies and they're not, I mean, he spent a lot of time in his lab, which in those days was more like his office. But really, um, his main achievement, his major achievement, he was a major achievement in the whole of history of science, was because he was based on the observations uh, of others and he, also made a synthesis and developed mathematics which were powerful enough to describe them, to predict. And so uh, I think Newton really deserves, uh, for me, uh, the qualification of a theoretical physicist, even though uh, even Wikipedia says he was also an experimentalist. His experiments are not really remembered, to be honest. Um, okay, so that's mechanics. That's how we start when we start at the uh, university. We start with mechanics, and of course, it's Newtonian mechanics. And then there is something we even do uh, in a course, first year course, which is we talk about energy. Well, Newton never talked about energy. I mean, if you read his book, uh, which is in Latin and not very easy to read, uh, you don't really see the word energy in it. And the reason is that energy is really a very difficult concept, and it transcends mechanics. It's beyond mechanics. In physics, we think that energy is one of the most fundamental concepts and for that reason it's also very difficult very difficult to define or i mean again Feynman <clears throat> in his funny quote he says difficult to get right again if you read the lectures chapter four there is the uh, uh, an analogy with concept of energy uh, and the character is Denis the menace in portuguese i think uh, you call him o pimentinha and it's beautifully, it's one of the analogies that I really love about energy and about how we cannot really define it, but we know one thing, we know it's conserved. And this is, or at least we based our description of the world on this principle of conservation of energy. And beyond the story of Pimentinha or Dennis, the menace, uh, which is very funny and, and, and very profound in, in, in Feynman, could, he had this power of actually uh, explaining very rigorously something which was difficult to explain in a language that looks like a story, a children's story. And it's, it's beautifully uh, written, constructed, and it makes the point. Uh, I often go back to it to read it when I get uh, uh, some doubts about something. Okay, so the history of, uh, in science of energy goes a different route. So um, in fact, it's based on um, contributions by people, many engineers. Uh, I think Jules was an engineer. 
the principal conservation of energy and thermodynamics, I think Jules was a, a French engineer, but sometimes engineers have good, very good, uh, and they make very good conceptual contributions. But basically, and beyond energy, there is also entropy, and this is uh, Clausius, and it's also one of the founders of thermodynamics. And this is what happened beyond mechanics. But if, if you see here, uh, even the conservation of energy already alludes to um, things like heat, which is what Drew did, and then electricity and magnetism, and even light. So there is a big unification here in terms of uh, uh, concepts that energy seems to be the um, mother of all these different uh, manifestations of physical phenomena and has this wonderful principle, or at least we think it does, and uh, experiments have not proved us wrong yet, uh, that energy as a whole is not conserved. So here is a very good uh, example of something we believe in. Then if theory, uh, we construct series based on it, and conservation is always tied up to a symmetry of our equations and so on. But forget that. And then if your experiment proves us wrong, we have to uh, change the theory. And this has not been changed and, uh, yet. And so this is one of the founding uh, pillars of modern physical science in general. Well, because I'm a statistical physicist and uh, condensed matter in some sense, uh, what followed thermodynamics, which is very macroscopic, it describes the world at our scale. Uh, we have some people uh, that Boltzmann in particular, who made connection with the microscopic, uh, and it's one of the founding fathers of statistical mechanics, which were then followed by statistical physics and quantum statistical mechanics. I'm not going to get into these details, but all of these are uh, typical. Um, branches of theoretical physics and they emerged as i said from the thermodynamics and uh, had great developments in the 20th century and even in the 21st you know uh, quantum information and so on uh, will probably lead to new revolutions but they're all based in these uh, statistical mechanics that was founded amongst others by ludwig boltzmann this is also contemporary and because this is one of my heroes this is maxwell I mean, Boltzmann was a theoretical physicist, right? Maxwell, Maxwell, Maxwell's equations, he's one of my heroes, uh, but Maxwell was a great experimentalist too, unlike Newton. And, and in fact, he was the first professor of experimental physics that founded the first director of the Cavendish lab in Cambridge. So sometimes we forget that he didn't um, do these experiments or he didn't put so much effort in experimental physics, but remember, experimental physics only developed as something that was taught at university round about this time. And when he was the first director of the Cavendish, this means that uh, people, remember I said training was very important, that training and doing experiments in a very uh, well-defined way and getting the proper training to do experiments was important. So it became part of the curriculum. And it became, it was Lord Cavendish who funded the lab in Cambridge, and that's why it still has its name, his name, uh, because it was very expensive. So experimental physics, even if it's not mega science, it's, it requires uh, appropriate tools. And I think uh, I'd like to leave the reference here that uh, Maxwell uh, was the first director of one of the big uh, and major um, laboratories. Uh, where training, not only research, research is, is done today. Okay, so now a little bit of my personal story. How did I start? Well, I mean, I was born like everybody and I was Christian, not like everybody and so on. But I started my scientific training uh, and I want to skip my early years at school where I did not know what science was. I did not know what physics was. I liked math. I sort of liked physics, but I was not quite sure what physics was. But then I decided to, to train as a physicist. And I went to this place, to the University of Bristol, as an undergraduate. The reason why I went as an undergraduate is also another story, and I won't have time to, to tell you this now, but, uh, uh, oh my God, I'm almost finished. Okay, but this is my PhD graduation. This is the hall where we graduated. This is the back of my uh, lab or, or, or school, uh, the Wills Building. And I want to mention three people from Bristol. These three people are Charles Frank, Michael Berry, and Neville Mott. He got the Nobel Prize. He founded really the experimental 
solid state lab in Bristol, which was at the time one of the best, if not the best in England. He hired Charles Frank. He got the Nobel Prize. He hired Charles Frank, who was very, very innovative. He was the director of the lab when I first was admitted as a, a student, as a first year undergraduate student. He also did a lot of solid state. He's well known for the series of dislocations and so on, but he, he, he trained uh, as a chemist, I think, but he, he was a wonderful person and very, very creative. And this is Sir Michael Berry. They're all knighted. Sir Michael Berry is a mathematical physicist. He was actually, he taught me. He taught me fields in my first year. And he also is known not for a Nobel Prize, but for a, a this is just some Ig Nobel Prize. I don't know if any one of you knows what an Ig Nobel is. You should look it up. But he actually managed to get a frog, a live frog, to levitate. And this was a joint effort with uh, Andre uh, Geim, who then a few years later got a Nobel Prize for graphene. And the reason the physics is uh, here, this is gravity, this is the frog, and this is a diamagnetic force. And so they could uh, balance it. And, and the reason why Michael Berry, uh, why nobody had thought about it, there were two reasons. One is experimental. This is Gaim. He was in the lab where they could actually produce the largest magnetic fields at that time. And then there was uh, Barry. Barry knew that um, there was this theorem by Unshaw that said, um, although you could do that with magnetism, you could not. This was an unstable equilibrium. But Barry had been working with the spinning tops and so on. And, and he knew that uh, if the, the, the things were not static, the objects were not static, this was not, this could be stable. And this is why, I mean, it's quite subtle. It's actually quite deep physics. So they both got this Ig Nobel Prize uh, and then Gaim got the Nobel Prize a little bit later. Okay, then I went to Cornell and I'm going to spend a few more minutes uh, because I have to tell you that uh, after graduation or PhD, uh, I went uh, for a postdoc and I went to uh, this Ivy League school in uh, New England well, in the state of New York. Uh, so, um, and I was in chemical engineering. This is the campus, a beautiful campus. And uh, this is me, this is part of the official. Um, so I should be finishing, but I don't have too much to say. So this is, I was part of the official staff because I was a woman, well, I don't want to get into that. You can ask me questions afterwards. But then I met these three people. These are much more related to uh, a lot of the research that I do now. This is Michael Fisher. This is uh, uh, Ken Wilson, and this is Ben Widom. Ken Wilson got the Nobel Prize the year I arrived at Cornell for the renormalization group theory to uh, describe phase transitions. Michael Fisher was a big drive uh, and uh, an energetic and very, very prolific uh, physicist, very, very creative. And Ben was already, he was responsible for hiring this man, maybe not for hiring this one, not only irresponsible, but it was the, the one who actually started it all, he invented scaling, which is something that within this renormalization group uh, story uh, became very important. So it's like he did the thermodynamics and he did the uh, statistical mechanics and he did everything. I mean, uh, maybe second, but he did everything. Okay, this is a little bit of bios on these three people. Those three people, did get the other medal. The other medal is the Boltzmann Medal, which is given by the Stat Fees uh, Committee, uh, which is a UPAP committee. And the three of them got these medals in different years. Uh, and so sometimes this was a precursor of the Nobel Prize, but uh, only Ken Wilson got both. Okay, finally Lisbon. I'm sorry I'm getting a bit uh, slow, but uh, it's difficult to tell these stories. When I arrived in Lisbon, we didn't have this logo yet, but we were already University uh, of Lisbon. And I did hear my aggregação, habilitation, whatever it is, uh, which in those days it was done in the rhetorate in this building. And here is me, not with teachers now, but with students. These were my students at the time, graduate students uh, and master or PhD students. And you might recognize some of them, uh, these three left, but this is, this you might recognize. I'm not going to tell you who he is, because he's going to show up a little bit later. Um, so in Lisbon, I was already a, a professor. I'm still in training, but as Nunu said, I really started to work on an area where there was not very much done here in Lisbon. So uh, I have 
rather than I have colleagues, but I didn't actually have a, a sort of the, the masters I learned from like at Cornell or even Bristol. Okay, so I want to finish more or less with this picture. This is the guy who was in that picture. You didn't recognize him. He got this prize, which is not a, only for science. And this is Henri Clayton. He was my PhD student. And um, so we went different ways, but we're still both at the University of Lisbon. And these two people are my colleagues. And one of them is Nunu. The other one is Conor Top. They also got prizes. This is not the Nobel or the Nobel. Maybe one day they might get something which is a little bit less local than the scientific prize of the Universidad de Lisboa. But that's, I mean, I've been in that panel for many, many, many years, and I'm very proud that they both uh, got the prize and also that um, they both from CFTC. So you never saw the CFTC logo here because when I think of schools, I think at the highest level. And for me, Universidad de Lisboa is really what I would like to, uh, to acknowledge. It's what I put on my, on my affiliation if I go to a conference. Okay, so I'm really finished. This is already uh, just the difference between theoretical physics and, and mathematics. And I'm ready for your questions. Okay, well, so. How do I do the questions now? <laughs> no, I, I, I can take care of them. So thank okay. you very much for your contribution. We already have two questions, so let's start with those. And the first one I think is related with, with the first thing that Margarita referred, the importance of training. So we have uh, Beatriz Araujo that asks if someone with a training in physical engineering is prepared or equipped with the necessary skills to work on theoretical physics. Of course, Sir Charles Frank had a, a degree in chemistry. And who else? Ben Witham. So, I mean, it's not, it's not just the roots. It's the roots and the fruit. What you have to think about training is that the training does not stop at the BSc, the training does not stop at licenciatura, does not stop at the master. I don't have a, I don't have a licenciatura, I don't have a master's, it's not <laughs> the titles, I mean really, I mean I have a PhD. Sir Neville Mott does not, never had a PhD, he got the Nobel Prize. So training is very important, but you should think of training as something which is long term. I was in chemical engineering for three years and I learned a lot. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I, I met these people, two of them were in chemistry, Fisher and Widham. Ken Wilson was in physics, but there was a community. So training is very, very important, but it's not so much, I mean, a lot of the training, at least that's the way they taught me in England, it's the learning and the environment. So you need to have the proper environment and the proper motivation to learn uh, what you need. So if you, if, you, if you manage those two things, training, it doesn't matter where you start, it, it matters where you end. Of course, some people start with a better, you know, some of us were born in, uh, <laughs> in, in, uh, in I, I was, a, I mean, I was born in Alentejo, who would say I would end up a physicist? So I think it's, yeah, uh, you're, you're more than equipped if you want to, but you have to want to, and you have to be prepared to make the effort to learn. Uh, so training is about the places and I showed you some places and some wonderful people. Of course, if you have, if you go to one of those places, your training has got to be better. Come on, let's not be stupid. Otherwise, I mean, science is, is taught, but also you learn by seeing other people doing it. So those places are very important, but whether it's engineering, physical engineering or physics, as long as you, you can even start as a chemist. You can even start as a mathematician. You know, it's, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> as long as you're prepared to do afterwards, fill in the gaps. So I never had very formal training and I did start as a mathematical physicist. But in England, formal training is something which, I mean, England was really known for the intuitive science, you know, those things Feynman was saying, or even Einstein or who, who else. Um, but of course, you also need to learn the hard mathematics. And, and the, the, so the French school or the German school are much more powerful in those um, tools, in, in training the students in those tools. The British are not, or were not, well, at least they're not very, very, they don't focus too much on that. Sometimes I need it, so I have to go and learn it. Or I have to look in books, or I have to ask someone. So I'm still in training. Uh, it's different training now than it was when I was at Cornell or even Bristol. but but I'm still in training. The day I, I, I stop being in training, uh, uh, I think I will retire. 
Okay, thank you. So the second question is, is from someone that did not sign, but basically the question is uh, if it is normal that someone doing theoretical physics works in different fields or is better to focus on a single topic? <laughs> I was not raising the question. No, 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 no. <laughs> but that, we discuss it quite often. <laughs> yeah, okay. In a way, it, it is true that some of the tools of a theoretical physicist, and I, I never use the word computational physics or computational physicist, because to me that has a very precise meaning and I don't want to mess it up. I think it's already enough to make this distinction between experiment and theory. So it's true that some of the tools we have as theoreticians can be easily applied outside of physics or to different topics. And that's fine, but don't fool yourself. If you really want to make an impact in the other field, you have to work with people from the other field, or you have to learn. You have to do all the literature survey. You have to read everything about sociology or whatever. And that's one way that some physicists go. It's applied physics, it's, it's fine. But to be useful for biology, to be useful for sociology, to be useful, you need to work with the people from those fields. Because your training as a physicist does not teach you biology, does not teach you economics enough to be by yourself, you know, uh, identify the problem and make the, uh, this contribution. So it's fine in this collaborative, um, but if you want, usually, if you want to get a Nobel Prize, or let's put the or even the Boltzmann medal, you really need to develop a topic, your own topic. People have to recognize that the contribution of this person in physics, because the Nobel is in physics, not in chemistry, not in sociology. Um, so, in, in, so, they, so you can focus and, and develop, I mean, if it's a good topic and if you're very good at it, uh, you, can, you can achieve um, that recognition. A problem, I mean, if I go back, uh, can I go back to my... Um, you need to share again, sorry. to Because to, to I think it, it helps if I, I show you it. something that I, I actually prepared. Um, oh, I need to share. Uh, I need yeah, to... share the screen again. Okay. Oh my God, how do I go back? Yes. I need to share again. Okay, but now... No, now it's okay. I'll, I'll put it in full screen uh, in a minute. Okay, so some, some of these people. Um, let's take the, the, the Bristol lot. The Bristol lot is Sir Charles Frank, Sir Neville Mott, then went to Cambridge. He's, many people probably associate him with Cambridge because he was a student at Cambridge, and then in the end, he, he returned to Cambridge. But he is really responsible for founding uh, the solid state not just theory, the experimental program in Bristol. And he got the Nobel Prize for work in semiconductors. He, he, he actually shared it with uh, Anderson, Phil Anderson, Philip Anderson, uh, who died this year, who did similar work, but with different, different techniques. But they, they worked on disordered uh, semiconductors, on how uh, the electrons move in these disordered media, and how on these transitions can occur, how to characterize them, and so on. So the Nobel in, in physics, it's attributed for a discovery. <coughs> Frank never got uh, a Nobel Prize, but um, his range of fields were probably more wide. He did polymers, he did liquid crystals. He is most well known by uh, crystal growth and these locations. There is a famous um, theory called the Burton Cabrera and Frank. Cabrera was a Spanish. Uh, Frank is this Frank. Burton must have been the student. I don't know. I never, I ne I never knew who Burton was. Uh, uh, Frank was still very much alive when I was in Bristol. Um, and it would have been difficult for him to get the Nobel Prize because even though he's so well known for the dislocation uh, work and the growth of crystals and the roughing transition, um, he, he, even within physics, he spread his uh, views. But he was wonderful. He always asked the best questions at seminars. Even seminars theory, uh, experiment, whatever. He always had the sharpest question. And Sir Michael Berry, well, Sir Michael Berry, he got the Nobel and he's been nominated, I know, I know, uh, he's been nominated 
for uh, the Nobel Prize for the berry phase. The berry phase is related to this very novel uh, uh, field of condensed matter, which is topological insulators. And uh, I have it for many people, uh, and everybody thought he should deserve or he should get the Nobel, and some other people who came after him would not get the Nobel before he did. Uh, but he's a very mathematical physicist, and uh, even though we work with um, his speciality, that's what I wanted to show you, I think he specializes in semi-classical physics, asymptotics. This is a mathematical uh, physics uh, subject. He applies it to optics, quantum cows, and so on. So um, maybe this is already a little bit too theoretical, too mathematical, even though th there are many applications. Because Einstein never got the prize for the, the gravitation, he got it for the photoelectric effect. Because again, in the Nobel Prize of Physics, it has to be something which is um, um, tested, you know, and, and nobody knew if general relativity would be uh, a theory in that sense. So in each one of these, so of course here I have the crystal growth, although I, mean, I, I wrote too much. Uh, but there are many other things, liquid crystals, uh, even worked in geophysics, mechanics of the interior of the earth. We had a very good geophysics department, uh, or not department. Um, some of the theoreticians were very good um, geophysicists. And, and so Frank worked with them and with other experimental people on this uh, geophysical problem. And even worked on the biological origin or the origin of biological homochirality. This I don't know. These are the work I, I know a little bit, uh, but is most well known by this research on crystals. So, um, Mott is, is best known for, uh, he did many other things and even worked on this problem uh, many years before, but not making uh, contributions to the level of the Nobel Prize. And, and so if I look at these people again, you know, they, they all, they, they're all known by something very concrete. This is scaling, although uh, the Boltzmann medal quote actually uh, refers to some of his illuminating is a word he used very much. And so uh, uh, statistical mechanics in general of fluids and, and he was a chemist by training. Um, so he was not very mathematical inclined. Um, Michael did get training in um, mathematical physics, but then he moved uh, to Cornell and he started doing statistical physics and very much, uh, he was probably uh, most responsible for Ken Wilson to get into this renormalization group study that ultimately gave him the Nobel Prize. And so, but again, you see, they very well known for a, a specific uh, problem. And many of them never worked on, 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 on a range of problems. So the, all these people are statistical physicists, if I want to call them something. Uh, well, Ken Wilson did the particle physics, but he got the Nobel Prize for something he did in statistical physics. So it's up to you. Some people like to focus. Some people are very productive in, in, in making progress in, in a particular problem, a difficult problem. Um, other people like to apply and they like to interact with other people. It's different. It's, there's not a single uh, profile for a theoretical physicist. Um, I think there are different theoretical physicists as there are people, but more or less, um, there are different classes. And, and I think, um, but it's really a question of taste. I don't know who asked the question. A taste and ability. <laughs> and ability as well, you know. I mean, if you're not very good at interacting with other people and applying to different fields, if you feel uncomfortable with that, of course, that's not your way of going. Yeah. But on the other hand, if you're not powerful enough to get into a problem and, and develop it until you make it your own, then again, it's very frustrating. So um, a good advice is you should choose your problem that should not be trivial because it should interest you but it should not be so difficult that you cannot do it. And then, you know, uh, finding out these is as important as actually, you know, it's a, the most important thing as well uh, for a successful and fruitful and non-frustrating career in general. Anyway. Okay, so thank you. We have many more questions. So wow. now we have one by Denise uh, Ribeiro. He writes a long introduction to his question, but I think that what he wants to know is since now 
so traditionally someone having a training in theoretical physics was expected to become a university professor. So the question is, what is the future? Is, is the future outside academia, at academia? What is your view? Well, if you've got a licenciatura, you're nothing. You're not even a physicist. But certainly you're not a theoretical physicist or, or an experimental physicist. You have to do some work of your own to become a theoretical physicist or an experimental physicist. So someone who finishes a PhD, well, 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 you, you're still training. Uh, a few people uh, like Brian Josephson, he got the Nobel Prize for work he did for his PhD, but he's a very unique person. And he also became totally crazy. I mean, I actually flipped. So usually the question goes the other way around. Uh, I get a training as a physicist. I may like labs more, or I may enjoy more doing um, analytical work or computational work. But you're, as an undergraduate, you're nothing. I mean, you're not even a physicist. You only qualify as a physicist maybe after your, uh, I don't know, master's. He, he may be after your licenciatura. But the course you, 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 you go to has some label that tries to make it a little bit, uh, uh, give it more training in, 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 in engineering approaches. Because experimental physics is not engineering. I mean, you have to make, a, that, that's a different distinction. Um, but I don't think, I mean, if you do physics, which is what you do as a licenciatura, if you do physics, you can become, um, you need further training even to go into the market. You need further training and uh, that training uh, can be if you like to work in industry or if you'd like to work in, in, in services. But quite frankly, I don't think um, you qualify for experimental when you finish. You don't have degrees in experimental physics and in theoretical physics. We have degrees in physics and even master is in physics. But your project may be experimental. And then if you're very creative, that will give you a problem of your own and then you start to qualify as an experimental physicist. Otherwise you just get or got some extra training in, in, in the lab. But, but I mean, a physicist is, a, is, is, there is the training and then there is the profession, you know, and the profession is what you do afterwards. So today to go back to the question is um, many theoretical physicists, if I dare to call them that when they finish a master's or even a PhD. So if they only did theoretical work and we call them theoretic. So they got theoretical physics training. I think that's a better, a better uh, description. Today they have a lot of uh, possibilities in the world because uh, physicists think better than most of the <laughs> trainees. No, no, they do, they do. They, 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 they should, at least they should think better. And they should be trained to think better and to solve problems. So in a way they're equipped, not just because of the mathematics, but they're equipped to solve problems. And many of the problems in economy and so on, uh, they don't need uh, experimental laboratory type of uh, physics. So you might say uh, a theoretical physicist is better um, equipped or, or but I think if you think well, they'll take you, whether or not you do your project in experiment or theory. You have to think well, and you have to be able to solve problems. Good. Thank you. So we have at least five more questions, and we are running out of time. Let's try to be brief. The next one is from Genivaldo Vasconcelos, that is asking, what do you think about the theory of everything and the need that all theories in physics need to be beautiful above all? Mathematics, next question. That's mathematics, not physics. <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay, uh, then... I've got it in my slides, it's mathematics. At the moment, it's mathematics. Okay, it's clear. <laughs> so, Rod Rodrigo Gazzola asks, what were the topics, the most relevant topics that we were working on when you started CFTC? When I started CFTC, ah, it's a good story. It's a good question. <laughs> 
I was working still on my soft matter problems, liquids, liquid interfaces, and so on. When I started CFTC, we were trying to, there was an idea to make people interact more with each other. The people were already coming from different fields. And we saw that uh, uh, getting dynamical systems with statistical mechanics and so on, we could apply these different tools and different techniques that some of us had um, to epidemiology or to some other, uh, the types of problems that you were, and we tried to do that to force, at least to encourage people within CFTC to collaborate. That worked to some extent, but then there is the next step, which, which is what I was saying before. Then to become a real, to make an effort, to make impact, to have impact in those other fields, then you really have to go uh, to Ricard George or to uh, the health public or to the Imperial College. I mean, yeah, you have to, there's no way you can apply your knowledge uh, to a field where you don't have experts in that field, be it economics, be it uh, uh, biology, be it um, immunology, whatever that is. Um, but now it's, you know, we hear about it every day. Everybody's an, uh, uh, an immunologist. So, the, so, but we had particle physics and, and so there is some relation between some aspects of condensed matter theory uh, in terms of field theories, which formal relationships and the way Ken Wilson but there was never a lot of cross uh, work uh, within those groups. This would be a cross work even within physics. And there were, there were people who actually made a very successful um, move to these uh, other fields like Georges Pacheco and so on. He's now in MINU in mathematics. Because uh, once you get out of the, the field of physics by applying it to sociology and so on, I mean, you can as well be a mathematician. I still think a physicist does it better. <laughs> but you can be in a maths department. <laughs> and better still, you should be in a, in a, in a sociology department or something. That's the so ultimate recognition. The, the next question is from an anonymous, but it's an interesting one. It's what about, what is that to be a woman in a world full of men? Like the world of theoretical physics. I was a woman and I was a foreigner in England. I felt more discriminated by being a foreigner than by being a woman, or I could not tell the difference. And a lot of that discrimination, I could make it work in my favor. So, okay, I always, I, I always did my thing. So, okay, I was more noticed. If I did something bad, everybody noticed. But if I did something good, then everybody noticed too. So if I did more good things than bad things, I actually got it to work in my favor rather than against me. What can I say? Very good. <laughs> okay, so João Olivia is asking if, uh, 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 well, it mixes a bit of things, but says the traditional way, if, if there is, uh, would you agree with the premise that the traditional way of developing scientific content, especially theoretical physics, is no longer productive? The computational physics is taking over all areas of physics. Oh, well, that's rubbish. That's <laughs> rubbish. If you stop thinking, computer cannot think for you. I think it goes in line with something that you said. I even took note. Robert, a robot is not a theoretical physicist. And this is an important message, taking into account that now with uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, people wrongly believe that it's taking it all, right? Well, it's not that. I want to make the point that, um, let me give you a, an example. Um, why is it that statistical physics made a difference in, in, in um, and I think it made a difference, when they analyzed these agent-based models and blah, 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 blah. Because we know about phase transitions, because we know about thresholds, because we apply the concepts that we learned in physics, in hardcore physics, to the numbers that we generate by, with our codes, with our rules, with our, within our artificial world. If you don't do that, then you have to let your world go and you have to guess the rules and you have to do it all over again. I mean, it's not enough to generate the data. It's you have to interpret it and you have to interpret it within a worldview. And that worldview, for me, when I think that physics is done in that way or is applied to those problems, is that we, we're using what we've learned in physics to um, 
understand what the computers are generating. Because of course the computers can generate the data in a way that, or can solve equations in a way that we cannot do it analytically. So they're very useful for that. But the model building, so the equations you use and the uh, analysis of the data and so on, I mean, that's based on good old theoretical mathematical models. I mean, without that, um, you have these, uh, what is it called? Uh, these, um, there are some games and some, uh, these games, you know, I mean, there are games. And then you have to find out the rules, you know, you have to do, it's, uh, I, I'm being a little bit um, dismissive because I know there are some problems and that's quite true, where you need big computers and they technical or even theoretical conceptual problems that you need the computers to number crunch to test the idea. But I don't think that's the question. The question is that there you had the question first and then you use the computers to uh, try and answer it. And uh, you don't just let the computers go when... So I don't know if I understood the question. This is my view. Uh, I'm pretty old, but I founded the uh, CFTC. I think computers are important. But some people evaluated us at that time. One said, but is there any theoretical physics without any computers? So, you know, there are different views about computers, but that's a different talk. That's a different story. Okay, good. So two more questions. The next one is from Jose Ferreira. And uh, he asks, if you feel that the pressure that scientists have to produce something in a short period of time is moving them from do a more dedicated work to fundamental problems. And if you think that this is changing the way we do science nowadays. It is, it is bad. I mean, Newton only wrote the Principia or whatever you say it in, in you know, 50 years the after he actually did the um, calculations. That got him into a very bad fight with Leibniz uh, to precedence to who had discovered uh, calculus. Um, and uh, things went sour in England for many, many centuries, at least two centuries. Uh, Leibniz uh, calculus was not taught there because uh, in England because of this row with Newton. So uh, that era is gone, totally gone. Um, but the era of producing many, many papers, uh, it's probably changing slowly. But I think I agree with the person who asked the question that in today, I'll make an, an analogy. Having to produce many papers, um, it's a little bit like the grades now. When I was uh, your age, or even younger, when I was at high school, 14 out of 20 was a poof! high mark 17 out of 20 I got that when I graduated I was the best in my school in my high school in Lisbon now everybody gets 19 20 they go into so you know there's a, a an inflation of the grades in the same sense there is a, an inflation in the way um, the production or the scientific production may be counted so but this is you cannot ignore it completely I mean because in many cases, you're judged by that. And so, but that shouldn't stop. I mean, if you think that's really, it shouldn't push you to work just for the grade or to work just for the paper. I know what I'm saying is very difficult because you need jobs. But um, it's true the system is moving in that direction. But we, sort of, we, play, we, play, we play with the system. And sometimes you have to say stop. Uh, but yeah, it's a good question. I sort of agree, but I don't know. I also don't have a solution for the grades. If I don't give someone a 20 out of 20, they, they want to know why they didn't get 20 in the, in the exam. And I said, well, because it's not perfect. And oh, why is not perfect? Well, here I would have answered, of course I know more than you, but so I can always, but this was not, um, now they, they come from high school with 20 out of 20 and they want 20 all the time. So. So this, for the papers, this is an analogy, so it's not perfect. But I think some of these has percolated or has been transferred to the way we measure, uh, we measure the quality, not just by the number. Just like a grade, the grade is just a number. What matters, and the way I got the prize when I was in high school, was I was the best student. 
of the whole school. And I only had 17. Now, if you leave, leave school with 17, not even the government allows you to say that this is an excellent uh, course. You know, you have to have above 17 to, to, get, to get into these uh, Ministerio de Ciencia courses with excellence, you know, the, the, the label of excellence. So, being more serious, uh, I think there are scales. What, ha what happens is that you have to be measured relatively within the scales that are used. What can you do to change the scales? I don't know, but they're going a bit, they're going a bit, you know, I mean, the students now are not, not smarter than I was. <laughs> <laughs> not on average. <laughs> No, nobody had 20 in my time. So, you know, what can I say? For papers, it's, it's more complicated. I, I, I think it, it, it varies a lot from field to field and uh, it varies a bit. But the grades, this is something you've all been through and, and you know, it, it's changed so much in the last 40 years. Great. So our final question is a perfect one to close. It's from Rodrigo Teixeira. And he asks, well, he heard you talking about the English school, the French school, the German school. So the natural question is, why don't we have a Portuguese school? And what makes a school and what is needed to have a Portuguese school of theoretical physics? Yes, yes. That was my dream. I mean, when I came to Portugal 40 years ago, and really even when I think of the university, not just of CFTC, not just of the department, not, I mean, when I think about Cambridge, I think of the university as a whole. Of course, I love the physics there and they're doing great. Oxford is doing better now, but they were not doing better in my time. And when I look at the Ivy League in the United States, Cornell was third when I was there. Now it's 10th or 12th or whatever. It's still Ivy League. But, you know, so it, it's, you recognize it's still the Cornell School. It's still the MIT. It's still Harvard. It's still Princeton is now seven or eight. So and I was looking at these numbers. So, again, these numbers don't reflect much, except they give you... You need time, you need money. And if you ask the rector, you need a lot of money. Some of these schools have been doing it and been doing it well for much, much longer. They're very rich universities, very rich. Oxford and Cambridge are very rich compared to all the other European uh, universities. And this is one of, uh, they're also some of the oldest. And I told you, you need innovation. I mean, in, in, in the 19th century, um, Maxwell was the first director of the Cavendish, a lord, an English lord, Lord Cavendish, gave money to create this lab, to build this lab, so that students could be trained. So what do we need in Portugal to do it uh, for the university, at the level of the university? Because you can do it at the level of a small group, but you see, seen from outside, you'll never see the group, you see the university. So this is really something that we all, if we belong to uh, a university, we should realize uh, we can individually be known but the university will only be known if as a whole performs better so you need money you need time you need innovation you need a very good leadership you need good leaders you need of course good students a measure of all that for example is how many of the students that you attract are uh, from, from abroad how many of the staff you attract are from abroad so this is the ultimate measure of how good the school is. So the reason why there is no school in Portugal, it's not recognized as such, there are certain areas, certain spots, but um, Universidade de Lisboa is not that bad. It's now ranking number one uh, over all the Spanish universities, and I think only second after São Paulo, which is also a very big university. But this is a size that's also a measure, you know, I mean, size also matters. It's not the only thing, but size like the papers, you know, the number also matters. If you have zero papers, it's not, not, not very good. Um, but we need time, we need money consistently, uh, and we need um, a strategy. We need to be innovative. So in one way, this seems contradictory because we need to follow a path. We need to guess that that path is the right one. And then if not, we have to change. I mean, those universities had hundreds of years. What about America? In America, they had very few, only uh, the big American universities are only, um, wow, well, they only started to shine really after the Second World War. And this was one for the Americans, uh, a benefit of the craziness of Hitler 
who expelled all the Jews, and, and, and many of them were very good academics, and they went to the states. The states had money to pay them. Many of these universities in the states are private universities. They have a lot of money. They have funds that are, I mean, the fees are enormous, but they also had funds from alumni, um, companies, uh, and, and so on. So they're very rich. Oxford and Cambridge are very rich because um, Henry VIII um, was going to, I mean, there were, they were uh, universities which were like many other universities in Europe, cathedral schools. And so when, when he decided the, the Roman Catholicism was no longer, he was the head of the state, he was going to uh, abolish Cambridge and Oxford. He was going to, um, but then he, he only abolished the monks and the orders uh, and he gave these universities uh, the lands that these monasteries had, which were rich, enormous. And so this, this is eight centuries ago. So they had a good start and, I, and, and I, I, it's not just a good start. They were able to run the marathon. They never lost track. They kept going. They always tried to become better. In Portugal, we have, uh, I don't know, we have uh, very few years of um, consistent, and I, I'm being, I, I, I'm not being mean, but we have few years less. When I arrived from America, just to give you an idea, I didn't have an office. My students didn't have offices. We didn't have a computer or a cluster. I mean, uh, so things have changed in 40 years, but 40 years is very short compared to 800. What else can I say? <laughs> That's good. So meanwhile, Mariana wrote here a question that follows more or less what you were saying and is saying, well, be more practical now that, that, that someone is looking for a master since you say that they should be surrounded by some of the best people, what is your advice? Oh, my advice is, uh, if it's within your reach, be, uh, go to the best. I've, I've always, um, yeah, you should go to the best place possible. But of course, the best place possible is not just Oxford or Cambridge, because it depends on many other variables. It depends on your life, if you can pay the fees, if you can survive, if you can... Uh, even if you go to those places, if you work in, in, in a very good group or to a marginal, you go to a marginal group that is not really, so you only get the glow of being to came to actually uh, work with the main people. So search, you, you should do a search. Uh, you should try to figure out what sort of field you like or you think you like. Then you should make a list of the possibilities. The possibilities are if you aim too high that they will not accept you. Uh, because they have many people asking to go there. So you should be, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I think you should do that. And, um, and there is not, there's not a simple route because sometimes to go to a good place, you have to get three no's from very other good places. Um, but you have, to, you have to play the game. And they're not, if you go with your own money, but even then, if you go to a very competitive place, they might say, okay, you have your own money, but I don't have space in the lab for you. I have other people that I want to train. So, um, but you should try the best you can possibly aim for within your preference, because there are some preferences in fields and in, in, in techniques and so on. People usually like what they're good at. And if they had a, a good exposure to a few topics, they possibly can choose. And if not, just follow. Um, if you stay in Portugal, well, look at the different places and go to the best possible place. If you have a chance to go abroad, then I think you have to narrow it down. So you have to start by choosing an area and then looking at different, um, I don't know. Uh, my own choices in some sense were very much my choices and in others they weren't. I'm not going to go into my own uh, uh, past life, but it's my life. You know, in some cases, I actually make decisions, some of which I don't understand now, but they were my decisions then. And I'm very happy to have taken them. They were probably the wrong decision. It's better to make a wrong decision, take hold of your future, rather than just let it go. So I live well with my wrinkles and my bad decisions. I've made some good ones too. So when I came to Portugal, I was here for one year 
And I was invited to go back to the United States. And I said, well, you know, that's a little bit, uh, that's a little bit too soon. I'll go in five years if I don't like it here because I need to give this place a chance. I came here because I decided to come back and I cannot go back the first, you know, at the first call. Did I do, was it right? Well, I mean, this is what it is now. And uh, it's quite certain uh, that I'm glad to have made a decision to be able to say yes or no. It, it's, so if you can, please do it. But you have to be realistic as well. I mean, if I aim for, if I want to become a professor in Cambridge, well, you know, I'm aiming too high. So the chances are I probably will never get it. And so I'll get very frustrated if I only want to do that. But if I now put a series of other universities, and by the way, I think the English um, school and, and, and so on, um, it's a little different from the continental. And I talked about the French and the German uh, I was not, I don't know the continental school so well, uh, and some things I can identify as French or as German, but uh, it's much more the, 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 there's a divide between the Anglo-Saxon and the continental, like in everything. I mean, the British are probably not European, I don't know. And they sort of, I don't know, <laughs> there is something. I lived there for 10 years, but it's, it's quite odd. Uh, Continental and, and Anglo-Saxon, I, I, I will defend that there are these two different schools, uh, but um, to be able to say something about the French, I, I know in some areas, but not in everything. Uh, so yeah, and, and ask, ask, I mean, you have something now, uh, which we didn't have. In my time, we had to ask professors, tutors, we had tutors, which is something like a professor, but something who sort of looks after you. We had to ask tutors. We could ask our fellow students, but they did not know much more than we did. So we had to go by word of mouth. Now you can look in the internet and there's everything there, you know? I mean, you might even see scenes you don't want to see, but you've got the curriculum, you've got the group, you've got the topics of research. Of course, you cannot see everything. So you have to narrow your choice and then to research. But I think now it's, and then contact them, get an interview if possible, and then, but yeah, you should try to go to the best place. And there are some very good places in Portugal, depending on the area. And, and, and so it's not, um, and we also need some people to stay here. We also need people from outside to come here because it's, it's this interchange and interchange of cultures that makes it uh, lively and keeps us um, fighting for it. But yeah, we're not at the level of Cambridge. I mean, what can I say? I would be lying if I said we were. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you well, for thank the you. clarity of the speech and the discussion it was very interesting, at least for me. And that's it. So we close here and we see you on the next webinar that will be the day after tomorrow on Thursday. Okay, if anyone yeah. wants to ask anything else that they yeah, think afterwards, um, if they send you an email or send me an email or whatever, I can try to answer because some of these questions sometimes uh, to be also practical and some of these questions require a one-to-one -one, uh, discussion. Okay. So no, no, I don't know if this is what you wanted, but this is what it's I perfect. thought about. <laughs> Thank you very much once again. And yeah, let's... We'll look up some of the people I mentioned. Because that's yeah. the other thing. If you want to know what a theoretical physicist is, look some of these names. There are two of them are dead. Ken is dead. And uh, Mott is dead. The other are still alive. They're, they're very old now, but uh, they're still alive. <laughs> they're old. But uh, yeah, look their web pages. Some of them have web pages. Or look up, um, of course, you don't need to look up Newton. And if you really want to know more, many people, um, well, there are some autobiographies by Neville Mott, A Life in Science, or that's by Michael Fisher, I don't know. Both of them have sort of scientific biographies. And then there are many beautiful biographies of other, uh, the more famous people behind them. There are some very bad ones too, but yeah, you know, if you want to know more, I think, because it, it varies with time, it varies with place, it varies, there's not a single definition. Everybody can tell you their story and the people they've met, but, um, that doesn't give you the full view. So that, that's my disclaimer, not the full view. 
Good. So if any of you have further questions, you can contact directly Margarida. I'm sure that will, she will be happy to answer you. So thank you very much for your time. And okay. Okay. See you soon. I hope. I hope. Uh, I hope it was not just uh, blah blah blah. No, it's perfect. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you.